So prokaryotes, which is bacteria, they reproduce in a different way than eukaryotic cells. So all the stuff that we've been talking about, mitosis and spindle fibers and all of that, that applies to eukaryotic cells only. Remember, that would be all the kingdoms except for those kingdoms that involve bacteria. So in bacteria, just a reminder, they have a double helix of DNA, just like eukaryotes, but it's naked DNA, number one. And number two, their chromosomes are circular, so it's a loop of DNA. They don't have histones, which are the proteins that uh, eukaryotic DNA is wrapped around. There is no coiling up into chromosomes to divide because their DNA is, is just naked. It's not in the nucleus, so there's no nucleus that has to dissolve, all that sort of stuff. Um, the area where their DNA is found is the nucleoid. And the name of the process by which bacteria divide is called binary fission. It's a very simple process. Bacteria can reproduce as quickly as every 20 minutes. So you could leave a small number of bacteria just overnight, and the next day you would already be able to see a colony or a group of cloned bacteria that have reproduced by binary fission. They're very, very fast. So this is a quick, simple process. Um, this is a little animation. So you have the DNA. This is a, trying to show that the DNA is making a copy of itself or replication, just like the chromosomes make a copy of themselves. Then it basically splits, and each new cell has a loop of DNA. Now, in reality, that loop is much bigger than that. So my next slide has kind of a more realistic picture of the amount of DNA that it would be. There's an area called the origin of replication where the, uh, the copying of the DNA starts. So this would be sort of like S, uh, the DNA replicating. It's like S phase of the cell cycle. But again, it's much, much faster. And then binary fission, it just splits, and you get two daughter cells, and they're exactly identical to the original. Okay, so the last thing in this section is how is the cell cycle regulated? Um, so there are chemical signals that tell cells when they should divide and when they should not divide. And there's specific checkpoints that we've discovered through the cell cycle where uh, basically everything is checked to see, first of all, is the DNA okay? Is the cell ready to divide? Does the cell need to divide? And that's going to determine how quickly cells divide. The proteins that are involved in this are called cyclins. That's not the name of a single protein. That's the name of a group or a class of proteins. So you have different cyclins. You may have a G1 cyclin or an S cyclin. They're different, uh, different types of cyclins. But cyclins are proteins that basically activate enzymes that are called CDKs, or cyclin-dependent kinases. And what happens when the cyclin activates the enzyme, the enzyme, CDK, turns around and phosphorylates proteins that are involved in the cell cycle. Phosphorylate, that's a big word, but we have learned it before. Phosphorylate means to add a phosphate to. So when the cyclins activate the CDKs, the CDKs then turn around and put phosphates on proteins. And you may remember that adding phosphate to a protein changes its shape and activates it. That's how the sodium potassium pump was activated. That's how ATP passes on energy. So phosphate being added to a protein sort of activates that protein. So at G1, there's a checkpoint. And if no signal is given to go past that checkpoint, that is when cells will enter what's called G0. And I mentioned that in a previous lecture. Brain cells, for example, would be in G0. This is a cell that's still going to do all the normal jobs of a cell, but it's never going to move forward through the rest of the cell cycle towards cell division. And there are some cells, and you don't have to memorize this, but some cells do have the ability to enter and leave the cycle as needed. So for example, liver cells live a very long time, so your liver cells would not be cells that would normally be dividing. But if your liver was damaged, the liver cells could be uh, stimulated to go back into the cell cycle from G0 back into G1, into S, G2, and all of that. And I got this online. Um, the picture at the top just shows how levels of cyclins change throughout the cell cycle. You don't need to memorize that or anything. Um, but the important thing to note is what I have right here about the CDKs. So CDKs are always there. And notice, I love this. I got this, I think it was from Khan Academy. This is showing CDK. This is the enzyme. But the enzyme, even though it's there in all of your cells, it's in an inactive form. Remember, enzymes sometimes need something to change their shape or turn them on, like coenzymes, for example. So cyclin is almost like a coenzyme. When the cyclin is made, the cyclin binds to the CDK 
and this basically activates it. Now it's the shape that it needs to be to be active. And then that enzyme turns around and causes phosphates to be added to these different proteins. And then that sends the cell into S. So adding phosphates to, set to, up to the proteins is what pushes the cell to the next stage of the cell cycle. All right, and um, so then, moving along, at the G, here's uh, just a visual to show you the checkpoints. Um, G1, S, G2, etc. Notice how there's certain areas. Just it gives you an idea that there's these checkpoints. All right, so what happens in cancer? Cancer is where cells are basically dividing uncontrolled. That's really all cancer is. It sounds, a lot of people think, you know, oh, lung cancer is different from brain cancer or bone cancer, but technically, the name like brain or bone or lung is the location where it's happening, but what's generally happening in cancer is the same thing. It's cells that are dividing out of control. Um, and so what happens? Well, normally there are some signals that tell cells not to divide. One of them is if it's very, very crowded. That's called density dependent inhibition. So when cells are crowded, they touch each other and they actually send one another signals telling the cells next door, don't divide, we're crowded right now. We don't need any more cells. Um, also, if a cell breaks off, so let's say, for example, a lung cell breaks off, ends up in the bloodstream, and travels to a new location, if it's not attached to other lung cells, it shouldn't be able to divide. So this is in a normal cell. Um, and, and therefore, these are sort of specific checkpoints also that prevent cells from dividing when they shouldn't. In cancer cells, there's a couple of things that can go wrong. One of the things that's very common in cancer cells is there's a problem with the cyclins or the CDKs. In other words, remember that cyclin is only made at certain times of the cell cycle. But what if you have damage to a DNA segment that the cyclin is being made all the time? Well, if cyclin is made all the time, it's going to tell the cell to keep reproducing all the time. Or CDKs, remember, are those enzymes, and they're made in an inactive form. But you could have a genetic defect that your CDKs are made in an already active form. So they don't need cyclin to tell them to phosphorylate proteins. They're already doing it. Or you have one of the proteins that they activate that's already in an active state. So if any of those things are going on, what's going to happen is that particular cell is going to be pushed through the cell cycle all the time. There's not going to be... Um, a signal that stops the cell from dividing. It just keeps receiving signals, divide more, divide more, divide more. The other issue is that you have these special genes uh, called tumor, tumor suppressor genes. And some people have defects in these genes. Or certain viruses like HPV can cause defects in these genes. So here's what happens. It's tumor suppressor genes are genes that specifically look for damaged DNA. So they're constantly scow uh, scanning the DNA and if they see a mismatch, a problem, where the DNA has the wrong code, they basically attach to it, and they send a signal telling the cell, this, there's a problem, do not divide, because your DNA has a mutation. And what happens in HPV, HPV doesn't technically cause cancer directly. What HPV viruses do is they destroy a protein called P53. P53 is actually a protein and a gene. Um, there's a P53 gene, a segment of DNA, and it codes for making P53 protein. And it's very likely you'll see this particular protein on the AP exam because you're, you're, we're hearing a lot about it now. But here's what happens. With HPV, it destroys this protein. Now, this protein is supposed to, if, um, if there's damage to DNA, this is the protein that sees it and sends a signal saying, uh-oh, there's a problem with this DNA, stop everything, and either uh, calls other enzymes to come fix the DNA, or it sends a signal for the cell to go through apoptosis, meaning the cell basically self-destructs. So if you don't have P53, it doesn't mean you're going to get cancer. It just means you don't have the protein that's looking for cancer cells. So if a cancer cell appears, the protein's not going to be there to stop it. But it's also possible that you're missing that protein and a defective cell never appears in the first place. I mean, that's kind of just a random thing that may not have anything to do with, with genetics or anything. And this is a, a little um, diagram that I got online that kind of shows this. So if damage, if DNA is damaged, P53 is supposed to stop the cell cycle and sort of send a signal to either fix the DNA or the cell should die. But if you don't have P53, 
then even if the DNA is damaged, there's nothing to stop that cell from dividing. And then that could lead to a cancerous cell. And again, one cancerous cell doesn't mean you're going to get cancer. Um, we'll talk about that in one moment. So this is just to show you Anchorage dependence. So that's the name of it when cells have to be attached to something. So if a lung cell breaks off and travels to another location, it shouldn't be able to divide because of Anchorage dependence. It's not attached to the normal spot, and therefore it should not receive the signal that it's okay to divide. The other one's called density-dependent inhibition. Notice here that this is crowded, it's full, and the cells touching each other, they actually send signals to one another saying, hey, it's crowded, don't divide. So cancer cells are not obeying these rules. That's why cancer can spread. Otherwise, it really shouldn't be able to do that. And so a cancer cell, if your immune system doesn't catch it, P53 doesn't catch it, all of that sort of stuff, then a group of cancer cells is a tumor. And a tumor is basically just a mass of cells that are growing in an area. And those cells, since they're just making exact copies of themselves, they're just going through mitosis very quickly, um, they're making more cells just like them with the same problem. If they stay at the site, they usually call it a benign tumor. That doesn't mean it's not dangerous. If you have a benign tumor in your brain, if it gets big enough, it's still going to push on healthy cells and you might have all kinds of problems. You could start having seizures, you could have issues. Um, but if it starts to spread, that's when it's called malignant. And again, the reason that this can happen is because the cells are not receiving the signals they're supposed to receive saying, hey, it's crowded, stop dividing. And uh, again, malignant, the ones that metastasize, so you have cancer you know, in, uh, in your liver, and the next thing you know, the cancer's in a lung. Well, how did it get there? Well, a cell broke off, and what should normally happen is that cell should receive a signal not to divide because it's in the wrong location, but because it's a cancer cell, it doesn't matter where it lands, it just starts dividing at the new place, and then you end up with a tumor in your lungs or in your bones or wherever those cells end up. Um, hopefully, we're looking into cures for cancer, um, that are better than the treatments that have traditionally been available. Because now that we have a better understanding of P53 and cyclins and kinases, if I go all the way back to these things, um, we are developing all kinds of drugs that specifically hunt down and only kill the cells with the damage, like the ones with a problem with their cyclin or whatever, and um, or a problem with P53. And um, unlike chemotherapy, which basically kills all cells that are dividing, remember, cancer cells are doing nothing but dividing. So yes, chemotherapy is effective at hopefully treating cancer because um, chemotherapy kills dividing cells. But cancer cells aren't the only ones in your body that are dividing. So any other cells that are dividing, like the cells making your hair um, and cell blood cells and things like that, they're also going to be killed by chemotherapy. So that's why you have all these side effects. So the drugs that we're developing now that are more specific, that are actually hunting down and searching for just the cancer cells and leaving all the other cells alone, this gives us a lot of promise for a, a, a true cure for cancer, probably in the next 10 years. I, I have a lot of faith that that will be the case. So that wraps up our, our uh, chapter on mitosis in the cell cycle. In our next lecture, we're going to be talking about sexual reproduction, meiosis, how do we make sperm and eggs, and how do we end up with a new organism, not just a copy of the cell that we started with?